Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Robin, and I'm going to talk about Professor Pi, uh, which is a Python modular developer. And I want to start with a, a question to you guys. Um, have you ever come up with a situation like this? You've produced a wonderful output of something. In this case, it's a graph that obviously looks absolutely wonderful with no axis labels and so on, but never mind. It's a wonderful graph, or maybe it's a wonderful CSV file, or a wonderful image, or whatever it is that you're producing from your script. And you save it, and you come back to it a month later, or three months later, and go, now how the hell did I produce that? Has anyone experienced that? But they don't know what, what they use, what code they use, what input data they use, and so on. Yep, the vast majority of people have got their hands up. And that's what I had, and I had it through my PhD, in fact, when I produced one thing that worked wonderfully, and it's a perfect example of something that I wanted to use in my thesis, but I couldn't, because I couldn't remember what parameters I used for it, or what input data I used for it. So I decided I wanted to try and come up with a way of solving this. And this is basically some kind of, sort of provenance type problem, lab notebook type thing of, you know, what did I do to create what I've got sitting in front of me? And if you're a biologist or a chemist or something working in a wet lab, you, you make very detailed notes. You know, I get stuff in this beaker with a combination of this and this and mixed with this and you know, at this temperature for this amount of time. But people in computer science and, and computational fields don't really tend to do that. So I tried to come up with a computational solution to this. Uh, but there were a couple of requirements, and the first biggest requirement was it must be easy, because we're all lazy, at least I am, and I don't want to do anything that requires me to manually annotate all of my bits of my Python code that do inputs and outputs or whatever. I wanted to just do it. Oh, brilliant, they started at the same time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Someone close that window, actually, yeah, thank you. That's really helpful, never mind. <laughs> thank you, anyway. Um, and also, uh, the second one really was that it must work with libraries without modification. I can't go up to the people who write Python or the people who write NumPy and say, you must do this so that I can have this cool Python module working, because that's just not going to happen, at least at this stage. And somewhat surprisingly to me, in fact, I managed to uh, come up with a way of doing this with this module, which we call Recipe based on the idea of a recipe, it's recording the recipe that you use to sort of bake your output that you've produced. And we, I first developed this with a couple of colleagues of mine, uh, Raquel and, and Yannicka, at um, the Software Sustainability Institute's collaboration workshop back in 2015, uh, which we won uh, the hack day, uh, with some tablets we're holding there. Um, and basically, it's actually a remarkably simple tool to use, and that's its idea, to be as effortless as possible. So if you, take, if you take a bit of code that looks like this, this is some fairly standard sort of scientific Python code. If people in here are sort of scientific Python programmers, um, exactly the same sort of things apply for any code you might be writing that use some standard built-in Python code and output functions. Uh, but here we're reporting a few standard libraries, reading in a CSV file, doing a plot and saving it, and um, doing some manipulation of the little attempt to here, multiplying it by 100 for some reason, and uh, saving that out again. To make this work with Recipe, to be able to keep track of exactly how you run this and what inputs and outputs you need to do. Thank you. Um, all you need to do is add one line of code to the top of it. One line of code that says import Recipe. And that does the magic. And the magic is what I get to demonstrate. So, can you guys all see that at the back? Yep. Yep? <coughs> Good. Right, so. Um, we've got a Python script here. Um, it's exactly the Python script you've just seen, so I won't go through it in detail. Obviously, it's actually got plus 0.5, but yeah. whatever, we're adding something to the temperature. Um, and it's got this import recipe option at the beginning. So if we now run this script, just like you would normally, we get an extra bit of output that we wouldn't normally get from the script, which says that Recipe has inserted a run, a particular run of your code into its database, and it's given it a unique ID. Now, the brilliant thing is we can then go and use a Recipe interface, one of the Recipe interfaces, either a command line interface or a graphical user interface, to query this database and find out some stuff about what it's recorded. So first of all, we can run Recipe latest, which tells you all the information about the latest run it recorded. And I'm trying to make this a little bit bigger. Can people still see the bottom of that? Yep. Yeah. Um, so you can see here you've got a, um, a run ID, uh, who it was created by, 
I ran this script using this particular Python executable, some Git commit information and so on, environment, libraries, and then most importantly, uh, we've got, I'm going to go on here instead, we've got the uh, input files and the output files. And you can see we've got the paths to the files, but also the hash of the file stored here. Now this means that by using the search mechanism of got into SFI, we can go back and say, how did we create this file? So I can do recipe search graph.png. Now what this will do by default is take the hash of the file of graph.png and try and look that up in the database. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about hashes here. I'm talking about a simple way of, of taking a large blob of data and getting a sort of relatively short string of characters that represents the, the content of that file. It's uh, nothing to do with the file name, it's just to do with the content. If I search for that, it will give me the same record back and say that's how you created it. Um, brilliantly, or very usefully, if I rename graph.png to lar.png and run the same thing, it still comes back with the same answer because it's based on the hash, not based on the file name. Although you can still search on file names as well if you want to, there's all sorts of, of options to the command line tool. Now, more interestingly, um, I don't know about you guys, but I don't commit things to Git or whatever version of the process I'm using every single time I run it and do a tiny, tiny modification. I tend to sort of back them up into, you know, this is an actually sensible change, but I kind of play around with parameters or whatever. Um, so let's do a bit of, whoops, let's do a bit of that. Um, we'll change this plus 0.5, maybe in honor of the last talk, we'll add on um, 273.16. Uh, people who are in the room for the last talk will get that. Um, and also, just before we run it again, we'll edit the .recipe.rc file, which is the recipe configuration file, which you can have global ones, you can have local per project ones, there's a sort of inheritance hierarchy of them. And it's very simple format, if we just turn on the debug mode, you can start to understand a little bit about what's going on. So again, we'll run example script.py, but this time we get quite a lot more output because it tells us what recipe is doing. And we can see we've got our run inserted again, but then it tells us, ah, I notice you've imported NumPy, so I'm patching some things in NumPy and sorting out various functions in NumPy. The same with pandas. And then it noticed that we've had input from this file with this hash, output to this file, output to that file. So it's telling you what it's actually recording while it's doing it. The good thing is if we now look at the latest run, uh, it looks the same if you look at it normally like that, but you can use the diff option to see what the differences are between the code that was, that code that was used for this run and the most recent git commit. And if you do that, you see at the bottom, so you get the same things at the top, but then at the bottom you can see that you've got a diff where you've got rid of the line saying blah 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 hundred, and added in the line saying and it comes in 73.16. So based on that information, you can get your script back to exactly what it was like at the time that you ran it to produce the file that you ran. Um, this is another quick demo. Um, there was also a graphical interface to this, which runs a little web app, web app on, the, on the local machine, it's like a like notebook or something. Um, you can search up here. You can view the details in a slightly nicer format than you get on the command line. Um, you can look at the git diff there. Um, you can also add in notes on a run. This one worked brilliantly or whatever. Um, you can do that on the command line as well in a sort of git commit style. You run a command, pops up an editor, fill in something, and, and finish it kind of way. So that's kind of what, what Vestify does, and a, and a brief demo of it. So, um, the key question really then is, is how does it actually do this? So, yep, go back to that. Um, oh, it's just to run through the features briefly. I think I covered most of these. So it, it deals with file hashes, it stores git information. Um, you can also look at output and input file diff diffs if you want as well. You can turn that on in the configuration option. So if you're it will do the, if you're storing a text format output file, it can actually give you a diff between what you created here and here and there. Um, it stores library versions, you can annotate things, search by various things. Oh yes, you can wrap the um, Python open command. It's quite difficult to, to patch in the way that I'm going to describe in a moment. But there's other ways to be provided that allow you to do, do similar things and get Vestify to capture them. Um, you can export to JSON, um, and then all these things can be turned on and off. But the key thing is, how does this work behind the scenes? Well, basically, if you take a script that looks like this, um, 
you the import specifier does a load of setting up to begin with, and then every time you call a function that does input or output, it goes through some sort of monkey patched hooks. Well, that may be a phrase that means nothing to some of you, um, but it uses these monkey patched hooks to grab sort of information from these functions before it actually gets passed to the actual function that does the work. Um, and it stores it in its database, and then it can go out to a, to a command line or, or a graphical user interface. So what is this, this monkey patching thing? Well, it's a bit weird, like that picture, um, but basically Python doesn't have anything like on-save hooks or callbacks or anything. You know, there's nothing in NumPy that you can say, hey, run this function when anyone tries to save out a NumPy array, or hey, handlers, when you read from CSV, let this function know about it. That doesn't exist. So what we actually do is we change the code at runtime. So we basically do something a bit like this. We create a function, for example, wrap read CSV, that basically here prints out you called read CSV, and then actually calls read CSV with the arguments it's got. So all we're doing here is just adding in one extra little print statement. And then we just do a simple assignment. The read CSV function in the pandas namespace equals wrap read CSV. Simple as that. Um, and that means that whenever we call read CSV or whenever another library that's imported at the same time calls read CSV, we'll get this little printout to the screen saying you call read CSV. Now, obviously, Metabyte wants to do a bit more than that, we can stick it into a database and so on, but that's the general idea. We stick this little wrapper function around things to grab the information we want, like the file name we're reading from or whatever, and then just pass it back on to the device you would have been calling in the first place. And we wrote a little um, simple function here, a patch function that sort of takes arguments in these various bits and, and allows it to sort of be done quite nicely. The next problem, once we've got this monkey patching working, is we need to store it somewhere. And we uh, decided to use a NoSQL database as a back end here because the stuff we were using was very much sort of Dict style, JSON sort of style. It, it didn't lend itself to a, to a standard sort of SQL with tables and columns kind of approach. Um, actually, the first uh, prototypes we developed used MongoDB, uh, which is great in many ways. It's a sort of book client server thing. You can have it remote, it's quite scalable, and, and so on. But it requires people to install it separately, get it all set up, run a Mongo server in the background. That's, that's too much effort for the average scientist, and probably too much effort for, for an average programmer like me as well, if I wasn't developing it myself. So we actually switched to using something called TinyDB at the moment, which is a pure Python NoSQL database. It's basically a fancy way of manipulating some JSON stuff and, and searching it and so on. But the brilliant thing is when you type pip install recipe, it installs TinyDB, it doesn't need to run in the background, it, it, just, it just works. Probably not very scalable. Um, I haven't really tried with huge numbers of, of records, but I guess it's going to slow down quite a lot. Um, but we can, we're hoping to sort of, over time, have a database extraction layer so we can go out to Mongo or, or TinyDB or whatever whatever works best in, in that situation. Um, the next issue um, that we had to deal with was that we could do this patching of modules, but we didn't know what modules to patch because we didn't know what modules was actually used in the script. We didn't even know what modules were installed on the machine. If we try and patch NumPy and they haven't got NumPy, we were like, is this going to work? We try and import NumPy, it's going to give us errors. What do we do? And we used something called sys.metapath. Now just as a quick survey before we start, has anyone heard of sys.metapath? No, great. That means if I talk nonsense, but I didn't work now. But basically what I'm saying isn't too much nonsense, it's probably just not 100% technically detailedly accurate. Um, basically, sys.metapath uh, is a list of objects used to search for packages. We fully makes very little sense, really, as a statement. But basically what it means is that when you do something like import numpy, what Python does is it goes through these different objects that are sitting in, the, in this basic, just a list of objects in sys.metapath, and it uses those objects and says to them, hey, try and load NumPy. And the object will say, yes, I can, or no, I can't, or, or no, I can't find it, or whatever. And if it doesn't work, it goes to the next one, and it goes to the next one. Um, and so basically, in at least Python 3, Python 2 is slightly different, as usual, uh, in Python 3, at least, it comes with a sort of default list of ways of searching for objects which is sort of to search the file system and to search the kind of built-ins and, and so on. Um, but you can add to that 
So the normal way that sys.path, uh, sys.metapath objects work is when you say you know, find numpy, it tries to search the file system. Or well, there was no reason why you couldn't write an um, object that actually tried to search online or automatically you can install it or something. But you know, for the moment, normally they try and search the file system. And then when you try and load the module, it says, might just import the module and load it using some sort of import machinery that works behind the scenes in Python. What we do is we sort of twist this to our own ends. And we say, OK, when we put some other objects on this path and say, when you're trying to find a module, don't, don't listen to it if it's saying it wants to find pandas or matplotlib. Only listen to NumPy. But when you find that someone's trying to import NumPy, say, yes, I can find NumPy, that's brilliant, yeah, I can do that. And so then very shortly after that, uh, the Python interpreter itself will, will, will call one of the other functions on this object, one of the other methods, saying, OK, you've told me you can find NumPy, load it in for me, please. And so rather than loading as a, as a standard Python module, we load it as a module and do our patching at that point. So we've hooked here into the sort of inner workings of the import machinery in Python. And the really great thing is that it's great that Python actually lets us do this. Because a lot of languages, I don't think you'd be able to get into that into those nuts and bolts of, of the way that the import works sort of at the language level. Um, so that's how we actually get the module imported and, and patched. Um, luckily, we made it a bit simpler for people to write um, classes that, that, that do this. Um, basically, what we've done here is we did the model Crazy Magic uh, up in the up in Patch Importer um, class and patch simple inherits from that, and it's nice and simple to use. And then below that, we've got the various um, classes that, that create the objects that actually go on to sys.metapath, um, <coughs> that patch pandas, and numpy, and matplotlib, and, and various other modules. Um, and these are actually really, really simple. Any one of you in here could write one of these for a module in about five minutes, I guarantee it. Because it literally looks a bit like this. This is the entire code of patch numpy, because all of the crazy magic is hidden further up in the inheritance tree. And we just create a module that inherits from patch simple, tell it what the module name is, Tell it, okay, these are a load of functions that, that are used for input, these are the functions that are used for output, and then we use a, a nice little utility function we've written called create wrapper that says, okay, whatever the input function is called, we want to call the function log input, which is what actually grabs the information about the input you're doing and stores it in Messify. Um, taking the zero of the argument, which in this case is the file name, so that's the bit you want to actually store and, and keep track of, um, and say, oh yeah, it comes from that part. Simple as that. And that's actually a really easy way to write things to extend this to work with a, a broader range of modules. Um, the problem we're currently tackling with Recipe, uh, luckily with the help of, of a lot of good people with the Software Sustainability Institute, just as a reference, who in here has heard of the Software Sustainability Institute? Hooray! Good. For those of you who haven't, they're a UK organisation funded by, by UK research councils who are focusing on software in science and the sustainability of software in science, because it's really important for science, um, but it's often overlooked by scientists, by research funders, by universities and so on. So they do things about um, you know, developing code effectively, but also keeping code running, the sustainability of, of things like that, with funding, to do with jobs, to do with you know, teaching scientists how to code, and they're involved in software carpentry, a huge range of things uh, they do. They're, they're a great bunch of people. And they have something called the SSI Open Call, where you can submit projects and say, hey, we'd like you to actually help us with this project and do some work on it. And so we did that for SSI, um, saying the real difficulty was how do we test this? How do we get automated testing and some kind of continuous integration going for this module? Because it hooks into Python in such a deep way that you can't just stick a unit test in there. Because it, you know, the unit test changes the thing that you're using to run the unit, you know, and you get into this kind of big loop and spaghetti kind of mess. So you need to basically end up writing scripts that are run through a separate Python interpreter that are then used as output to test it. It all gets rather complicated. Uh, very conveniently, a lovely guy called Mike Jackson from the SSI um, is actually spending a month or two developing a full automated test framework for, for Messi, uh, which should be really easy to extend in the future and, and develop as the module goes forward. So that's what the SSI are doing. Um, this is potentially what you guys might be doing. So how many people here are staying on Monday for the sprint day? Brilliant. Okay, well, one of the sprints that's happening, I don't know what other sprints are happening, I haven't seen the list actually, but one of the sprints that's happening um, is a Recipe sprint, and it'd be great if anyone wants to come along and, and help contribute to this. 
Um, we've got all sorts of things you can do, both coding and non-coding things. So if people here don't feel quite so confident with Python programming or want to you know, use some of their other skills, if we've got any great artists here, then um, we need a logo. Um, but we also need to work on websites and the docs and things. There's other things that need improving with the command line interface, fixing bugs, patching other modules, you know, all sorts of things. So if anyone wants to come along and help out with that on Monday, that'd be great and I'd love to see you there. And I think that's <laughs> it for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This, I was really looking forward to this talk because this is something that I have a problem with all the time. Um, all, every time I'm doing any work, I think this now this time I'll I'll fix it. I'll do it properly this time. Yeah. Um, never, never any time. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Um, so when you searched for lab.png because mm -hmm. you had changed the name, it still searched by the hash. Yes. Is that because it reworked the hash? Yeah. It, it, but basically, when you, when you run Metify search file name, it takes file name, calculates the hash of that file, and then searches for that hash. Um, if it, it, it can't find it, it tells you it can't find anything with that hash, and you can then say, okay, in that case, search by just the file name. If you've done some sort of, let's say you've, you've, got, you've created your graph and you've done a little bit of modification to it in Inkscape or Illustrator or something to add a few extra bits or whatever. Um, so potentially with very large files, I could slow down the process quite a lot. Yes, so the, um, that is one of the issues. The, the hashing is pretty quick actually for even relatively large files. Um, what you can do with again in the Recipe um, RC file is there's a section called ignored metadata. And you can say, okay, for anything running in, in this directory or in this project, ignore um, input hashes or, or output hashes or whatever, don't, don't bother computing them. Because that can slow down, as you said, if you're outputting a template file, that can actually that, that can slow down the run of your program as well as you then trying to search for it later on. Yeah. Does it handle <coughs> online arguments? It does. It cool. does. Um, no. I don't know whether I I don't think this one actually takes any other arguments, but if I try that, let's see whether this works. Yes, using command line arguments, etc. Yeah. Did you say you can't deal with uh, recursive imports? Or depth? So one important that, that one if if you're patching one module that gets imported, if that imports stuff that you also want to patch, did you? No, say that works fine. That works fine. Oh, okay. I yeah. Was, so that's one. Of the, oh, sorry, possibly I said that. Yeah. So basically, um, because we're hooking in at the at the low level of the imports, it just whenever that module first gets imported, it gets patched. And once five modules have been imported, they kind of just sit in in a in a dictionary. Yeah, so, you, so you start loading it. When it's finished loading, you patch it. And if it called something else, another instance patches that. Um. Yes. Basically. Yeah. And presumably, you walk the rest of the way down the meta path to do the imports. So. Um, yes. Yeah. So so you're at the head. Yeah. And then, and then you might have a zip file importer and. Um, and a file system importer, yeah. and you just call those guys and whatever else is in them. Yes, yes, that's right. Yes. Okay. I'm just trying to think back to when I wrote that. But <laughs> yes, yes, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's right, but that's going to go on the bug track for me to double check. Uh, with a test to make sure that it works with zip file import. Thank you. Uh, let me just know. <laughs> um, you, you don't tend to see zip file imports um, from command line, uh, from the normal Python, but it's there yeah. and it's used for packaged. You know, like if you turn your Python app oh, like code into an app, yeah. you know, Py to app or something like that, yeah. it creates zip files. And apparently it puts binaries in there, but I haven't got to the bottom of that one. Okay, binary But you definitely, if someone did that and you wanted to use this with it, you'd yeah. have to... Make your view of what, yeah, I think yeah, yeah. we are, but I'll double check that, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it's um, save your information uh, if you're uh, using Git, mm -hmm. is there any support for other version controls? Uh, not yet, but there's absolutely no reason why there couldn't be. Um, if you'd like to input that on a half day, that'd be great. Uh, but yes, any other, we're, we're, there's, there's an open issue saying, hey, we need to support Mercurial and whatever else the cool guys are using these days. Yep. Um, what happens if you try to import C other libraries? Um, so we haven't yet worked out an effective way of patching the 
We haven't yet worked out a fully effective way of catching the functions in C libraries themselves. Um, but a lot of libraries that are using, so if, you, if you just literally import something that you've written in C, that's not going to be patched at the moment, yeah. although we possibly could do that. Um, modules that you see things kind of underneath but wrap them in a bit of Python. Uh, um, you know, like a lot of pandas and not Python things, it's, 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 it's Python and C and so on underneath. They just work absolutely fine. I don't think you'll be able to patch the C ones. I, I imagine Certainly not if I'm behind the C modules you're trying to patch. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, two part, if I may. Mm -hmm. uh, first, this is brilliant. What happens if you've got an analysis script and it imports a function from another script that's in your repository and you change the second script and you don't check in either of them? So at the moment, um, it records the diff of the whole repository. So anything that's been anything that is currently being tracked in your anything that will be shown when you run git diff basically. So anything that's being currently tracked in the repository, if you import from another module that you haven't yet done a git add on at all and is not known to get in the slightest, that won't be tracked. Okay. And the second part was could you use this like a memoizer so that if you've got some long running analysis and Recipy knows that you haven't changed the input file, you haven't changed the script, you don't actually have to run anything. You just yeah. produce the same output. Sounds great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the bit you don't track is that if if I modify one of the data files, yeah. you know the hash is different. Yeah. But you don't have a rep you don't have a copy of the original data. No, you don't. So your problem about I want my I can need my PhD and this is the graph that gets it to me. Yeah. You're you're stuffed if you you know the code that yeah. produced it, but you don't know the data. No. You're right, and the the way to solve, I mean, the way to, there's, there's no way of, well, we could set it up so that in fact, and one, one, one option we have been thinking about is, uh, again, a configuration option to say, save the data files that use this input in the database if they are small enough. So if they're, a, you know, if it's a tiny parameter file or something, or a you know, 20 line CSV file, that can be whacked in the database with no effort. If, like in my PhD, it's a five gigabyte satellite image, you, you probably not going to want to be copying that around all over the place. Um, however, the other another thing we can do is a command, um, like we talked about pi track and so on, a command that does a similar thing with this. It says, okay, you grab everything that was referenced in this specified run and stick it all in a in a zip file um, with the code you know, modified by the diffs to get to the right stage or whatever, stick it all in a zip file and and then yeah, that can be taken around with all of the data and all of the scripts and everything. Possibly it would be writing parts in the files or something, but that might get a bit nasty. Um, there was a, yes, thank you. Um, there was another question somewhere over here yeah. that was, yeah. Is it possible to have a single database for several machines? That would be the benefit of something like Mongo or, okay. or something like that. Moment. At the moment, TinyDB is designed for local stuff only. Um, it's one of those things where I'm sure you can stick it on a network drive, but God knows what happens if you both try to write to it at once. Yeah. I suspect bad things. Um, so yeah, that's that's where something like Mongo comes in really useful because you can run it as a server in your lab, you're on your main lab machine, and everyone, everyone can, everyone runs get saved there. You can search what other people did, and you can find that oh, Bob was the person who ran this file that created awesomegraph.png. As well as know stuff about it, I can go and talk to Bob because I know Bob made it. You'd um, need to recall the some on your sorry on your own map, on one of Yeah, it's on our own map. Yeah. It, it's not going to be happening. Well, unless yeah, I mean, yeah. people, come and, if people want to come and try implementing it on, on Monday, yes. Oh, sorry, you do have a commitment, yes. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. but people, um, yeah, it is not going to happen immediately, but it's something we're definitely thinking about, yeah. Yep. How do you handle random numbers? Good question. <laughs> now, again, it's on our, it's on our, um, our issue list. Uh, we don't at the moment, um, but we're aware that's the problem. Um, we, we, we think about various ways of solving it. There's a few tricky issues in there. Um, I mean, that's not easy if everyone just put just manually set the seed at the beginning of all of their scripts, and that doesn't happen. Well, that, actually, I do that in my scripts quite often, but that doesn't happen. Um, yeah, talk to me later about that, and we can tell them how to do that. Hello. Um, I, I don't want to, I, I feel like the king's new clothes here. So, if you just check your source code into a revision control system, yep. Doesn't the vast, doesn't a lot of what you've done just happen automatically? Yeah. So if I, so I have 
a vast amount of code. Yep. The most important thing about anything, whether it's a source file or data, is you've got to put it in a revision control system. Because if you don't, you end up in a mess. So yes. if you were to dis be disciplined by saying, take all my Python code, check it in, run the test, check by continuous integration, I can get diffs from my files automatically from Git. So yes. what? Okay, so um, yes is the answer. In many ways, I can do a lot of stuff like that. Um, there's a few responses to that. One is that it doesn't, when you've got an output file that you have saved somewhere, that is an app, a sort of file that you don't want to check into Git. For example, it's a 5 gigabyte satellite image output file, like I was dealing with it. Yeah. Um, you want to then be able to find out what, what, what it was that, what exact, you, you may have all this stuff in Git, but which Git revision was actually used to create that file? It's a question that you may you're going to You're going to be using Jenkins or some continuous engine that runs your tests for you and gives you a green light. So the important thing is when you write your code, you write your test, you, you hand it over to Jenkins, that runs it, you get a green light. So then you've got your um, provenance because Jenkins is keeping all of the revisions that it used. This is not software engineering. This is research. And that's different. <laughs> so, 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 Isn't that the... Yes, I know. I've, I know I've come from, yes, I understand the problem. Because you've got scientists who are not software engineers. No, no, I don't think it's a discipline problem. I no, think this is a workflow no, problem. Yeah, no, you don't have to. Well, what tests will be like? Well, if I'm developing an algorithm to, to, to process a satellite image and tell you where all the green fields are, yeah. I could have, when I finished developing my algorithm, I could have tests of, yeah. of whether it got the right answers or not. Yeah. But I then have a few little knobs I can tweak about exactly how it tries to find green yeah. fields. And I want, and I've found you know, my lovely outfit with my perfect green fields around Cardiff. How do I know what knobs I've twiddled in that one? And so on? am I going to commit every time I twiddle a knob and try running it? Yes, you are. Am I? Yes, you are. It's, 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 that's what the continuous of continuous integration is. Every time you make a change, the problem he's solving is going from the output file to the yeah, yeah. code. And, and I have, and I have to check your output file. Yeah. You're and not going to have that. I have big data as well. And you have to preserve it somewhere, otherwise you can't reproduce your tests. Well, well, if you're going to throw stuff away, then I, I, I miss something. I don't know if it's going to take like 100 terabytes of time. There's yeah. no way I can, I can commit that to get. No, but you can devise a system that keeps it. You must keep it safe somewhere. No. Most of the outputs that I create, I mean, you know, unfortunately, in, in my actual personal experience, I mean, again, people might differ a bit, in my personal experience of, of my PhD, the vast majority of the outputs that are produced through my algorithm when I was developing it through my PhD do not exist anymore because I had one or two or four or five terabytes of hard disk space, yeah. and that was it. And I couldn't afford to buy unlimited hard disk space to store all of my, all of my fiddles. Uh, your implementation would be because your source code. But so I think the, the two issues are the thing. The problem Robin's trying to solve is that the thing about twiddling the knobs is not that the knobs are in the source code. They're command line arguments that pass at the source code. So that that's the thing. Well, that can be source as well. It's a text file. That you can <laughs> They well, can. I'm yes, writing, I'm writing it. Got, we have got no, another question. Uh, Big from an ops point of view, this is great because I have stuff that I'm not allowed to check into Git because of the security point of view. Uh -huh. um, I can. I have local stuff that I have to run my tests against. Yep. Um, this is amazing. Of course, stuff like that. Uh, I'm just wondering if you can build up uh, a list of uh, run IDs and then automate running them sequentially, so I know if when I update my uh, script whether I've broken something in my um, unit test. Great idea. Um, you can't at the moment, but there's no reason why that couldn't be implemented really easily. Um, so one thing I started playing around with very recently was a, a very simple reproduce command from Recipe that basically grabbed the, you know, it had a few options to when you grab the latest version of the code, all the exact code that was run in Recipe, in, in that particular run, given the right ID and would grab all of the things and run it and, and get you got the same answer. So yeah, there's no, no reason why you can't do that. Okay, great work, thank you. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Any other questions? Thank you very much.